There we go. All right, and we're going live. Okay, and we're live. So I'd like to welcome everybody today to our workshop with Derek Chu, musician practicing during the COVID era and beyond. So take it away, Derek. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you, Natalia, for inviting me here. Um, and to everyone who's joining us this afternoon um, or morning or evening, wherever you're tuning in from. Um, on, on Zoom, I can't see who's here and um, don't have any names, but uh, I'm. It'd be great to meet with you at some point in time. So if you do have questions, uh, you can type them in, and uh, they'll get fed to me, and I'll answer your questions along the way. And uh, but I'm just I'm gonna just share my screen here. There we go. And uh, I'm gonna be talking about what some musicians, including myself, are doing during this COVID. Uh, with practice and how we're getting our work done because this is always something that's very interesting for uh, non-musicians. They think that we're out of a job and we're just sitting around and, and for some musicians, this is kind of a time, it's a downtime and, and many are unsure of what uh, they're up to. So I am the Alberta Regional Representative for the Royal Conservatory of Music. I'm also a member of the College of Examiners. I have a studio here in Calgary where I teach, and I also teach at the Cremona International Music Academy, which takes place in Cremona, Italy. Cremona is the city of violins where Stradivarius, Guarneri, Amadi, um, Guadagnini, some of these great violin makers uh, honed their craft. And I also teach at the JVL Music in the Summer Festival. Exciting news about this summer festival is uh, this year, as long as uh, it's safe, to do so, so actually for 2021, we'll be doing our festival in Vancouver Island. So we have a little site about 40 minutes uh, outside of Victoria. And if any of you are interested to participate in the summer music festival, um, please let me know. We have room for strings, piano and voice. And every student who participates will have uh, private lessons master classes, ensemble work, and uh, many, many opportunities to perform. Okay, so is the world temporarily closed right now? I mean, it sure seems like it, no matter where we are in the world right now, outside of maybe a few exceptions, there are just lockdowns of all sorts of uh, levels. Here in Alberta, things are just mildly locked down, um, there's no phys uh, physical studio, physical education studios open, team sports are closed, um, you know, churches, they've put restrictions on that, restaurants have limits in terms of numbers of people and also uh, the hours that they can operate. And that's very much the case for many restaurants around the world. But is the world closed? This is a very interesting question because for a lot of musicians, yeah, the world is closed, right? We're not performing. The opera is not operating. We don't have symphonies. When there are performances, they're all virtual. And it's a very different experience performing virtually than it is in person. Um, I did a virtual performance this past Wednesday. It was very strange for me. <laughs> it's the second virtual performance I've done during the pandemic. And I'm used to walking on stage I'm used to seeing my audience and reacting from my audience. I'm used to being able to feel how they're feeling. I can hear them breathe. I can hear them move. And those are things that help me to perform. Those are things that help me to zone in. Those are things that allow me to go deeper into the music. But performing from home without an audience in my space is very different. You know, I had the audience. They were all online, um, but I couldn't feel them. 
I knew they were there, but I couldn't feel them. So I, <clears throat> I couldn't tell how they were reacting to a phrase. But for many of my colleagues, um, this has been a very difficult time because they're not performing. They love to perform. They've had tours canceled. Um, like I said, the opera is shut down. Broadway is shut down. And perhaps, you know, there's hope that maybe some orchestras in North America will be able to do um, a couple live performances in the late spring. But it's more optimistic to think that live performance is going to begin in September of 2021. So the world is closed, but our minds should not be closed. Our mentality should not be closed. There's a big difference between having opportunities and having them not available right now and then creating and making sure that you're ready for your opportunity once everything is good to go. This is what I'm looking forward to again. I'm looking forward to being on a stage with the piano, with an audience performing. And I'm excited. I'm, I'm very hopeful. I'm hoping to be back in Italy this summer. And because I'm hoping to be back in Italy this summer, I have to be ready. I'm not taking this pandemic time as a moment to just hang out and chill out. In fact, the moment that the pandemic hit, I knew all my, cancel, my concerts would be canceled. And then I just said, okay, now it's time to learn repertoire. It's time to learn all that music that I didn't learn because I've been too busy preparing for concerts. I've been having to relearn pieces for concerts or do some chamber works. And, and there was this growing laundry list of pieces that I want to do. So that list included the Chopin B minor sonata for piano, the Prokofiev seventh piano sonata, um, Mozart B flat major sonata, K333. So those were three of the big pieces that I said, I, I got to take advantage of. I got to learn this. So on day one, when the pandemic hit, my mind switched from, okay, I'm preparing a concerto to now time to learn music. So I've kept that mindset now for the past six, seven months that we've been going through this and, and waking up every single day um, at five in the morning and I practice for three hours immediately. I've always been doing that. And, you know, it's, it's very easy to sit back and think, well, we don't have any concerts coming up. I don't need to really practice. Well, the truth is, for me, practicing is my life. Music is my life. I, there's nothing else I would rather be doing than getting up early in the morning, learning music, plugging away at the pieces, and getting better at what I do and concert or no concert getting better is the most important thing and I live by this mentality <clears throat> that every single day I must improve by one percent there has to be a minimum growth of one percent and you know we don't live in a world where it's zero percent or a hundred percent the world we live in is infinite so if you grow 1% every single day of your life. <clears throat> Imagine where you're going to be with your music or your schoolwork or on your Peloton or whatever it may be. <clears throat> it's about personal growth because this is what I'm looking forward to doing. <laughs>
that's the first movement of L'Histoire du Soldat, the trio version, uh, by Igor Stravinsky. And that was performed, um, I'm joined here on stage with the concertmaster of the LA Opera, Roberto Cani, and a clarinetist from the Boston area, uh, Marguerite Levine. And this was our last performance together in the summer of 2019 in Cremona, Italy. And this is what I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to being back with my colleagues and making really beautiful music. And so to, to be ready for this, I need to be practicing now. I'm not going to wait and see if the world is going to open up and when the world is going to open up and then sit down at the piano and say, okay, now it's time to get back in shape. No, I've been in shape. I'm always in shape. And this is the mentality of a professional musician. We're going to be ready. I'm going to be ready when the stage lights go on because I want to be first in line. This is really important because as we speak, we're, I'm lining things up for the summer in, in June of 2021 because we hear that vaccines are going to be arriving very soon. Uh, for some people, they may receive their vaccines before the end of the year for the high risk and, and those in, uh, who are first responders. And um, people are going to start receiving vaccines in the new year and into the spring. And if that's the case and the world begins to open up at that time and stages are ready to go, I'm going to be ready to play. I'm going to be ready to walk on the stage and entertain and showcase the music for my audience. I'm not going to wait for that opportunity. This is really important. I have to be ready when the stage doors open. And, and that's not for the pandemic. That's just a musician's mentality. When we're about to perform, when we walk on stage, we don't have doubts. We're not thinking, well, I hope I play this well. I hope I don't make a mistake here. That's not how a professional musician prepares himself to be on stage. When I'm about to walk on stage, I know I'm going to play well. And, and that's not being arrogant or anything. And that's just the truth. You know why? Because I've been preparing. I've been practicing for this. Okay, I'm not spending hours sitting at the piano hoping to play well. And, and I hope none of you have that mentality either. And I know that for students, you know, walking on stage can be a little bit intimidating. I, I understand that. I know there's some nervousness. I know there's some fears. I know there's apprehension. But if there's one thing you learn from me today, just appreciate this the fact that you're practicing and you're committing yourself to getting better at what you do is going to prepare you for the stage take you know you have to trust your practice you have to believe that your practice is going to allow you and encourage you to have great success on stage like i said you don't walk on stage hoping to play well you walk on stage knowing you're going to play well there's this cellist that I know. Her name is Anzo Gaber. She's from South Africa. She currently lives in Vienna, Austria. And Anzo is this amazing cellist. She has this beautiful sound. She's so musical. And she's this very humble musician. But the one thing that always stands out to me is the way she's so encouraging. When we're backstage and about to walk on to the stage, she always says the same thing. She looks at me and she says, have fun. That's all she says. And then we walk on stage and we have fun. And we make music. Because it is fun. That's the thing. I, I don't look at the stage as this scary place. I look at it as a place where I'm going to have fun. And if we look at what actors and the pop musicians do, when they go and make a film or they're about to go and perform live, they're going to have fun. For some reason, in our classical mindset, we don't equate playing a Beethoven sonata or uh, a Clementi sonatina as fun. For a lot of students, it's equated to fear. And that's the wrong mindset to have as a student. And that's the wrong mindset to develop as a teacher. For the teachers out there, make performance fun. 
make it exciting. And then we're going to talk about some different ways um, that you can do that during the pandemic. We have some really wonderful, helpful tools that are available to us. The funny thing is these things were always available to us for the last few years. We just never took advantage of them. And now you see more people doing it because you're forced to. I want to tell you a little story here. So this is New York City. This is a uh, part of the lyrics from Empire State of Mind by Jay-Z and Alicia Keys. These lights will inspire you. These lights not only inspire me, they are me. When I lived in New York City for 10 years, I would walk down these streets. That's the Empire State Building there, one of the most iconic buildings in the world. And the lights, they encouraged me, they drove me, they inspired me. They taught me to be who I am. Why? Because New York City is the best of the best in everything. Those who go there and survive and get through all the challenges and then go home or go over to where they want to be always have a sense of an accomplishment and this drive. So back in 2001, I was a graduate student at the Manhattan School of Music. I had moved there in mid-August got myself settled, checked out the city, met some people, and I was supposed to have my very first lesson with my teacher, Dr. Solomon Mikofsky, on September 11th, 2001. So I got up bright and early. I was in the practice room, and I was practicing, I was getting ready, and this was in the dorms, the newly built dormitories at the Manhattan School. And as I'm practicing, one of uh, my classmates knocks on my practice room door and he's like, Derek, we got to go up to the roof. You got to check this out. And I, and I said, well, I got to practice, man. I got, you know, my first lesson with my teacher a little bit later today and I got to really, you know, play well. I want to make a very good impression. I want to be ready. He's like, no, no, no. He's like, you need to come and look at this. You may not even have a lesson today. And so I went with him. We went to the elevator, went to the top of the building and he said, check that out. And you could see the World Trade Center on fire and all the smoke coming out of it. And I was like, oh my gosh, what in the world's going on? He's like, don't know. They said, maybe it's a plane and threw in, uh, flew into the building. And, and so we just kind of hung out. And then, and then we, um, we saw the second plane. And we saw the second plane fly into the other Trade Center. And at that moment, all of us, stu all the students at the top of the building, at the Manhattan School in the dorms, we just looked at each other with this moment of shock. We didn't really know what to do. We didn't know what was going on. Um, we hung out there a bit longer. We saw both trade towers fall. So, you know, here I am, graduate school, ready to go and learn, and, and we don't know what's happening. You know, this world is falling apart. And so... The um, president of the Manhattan School at that moment, who was Marta Istomin, she said she had all the students and faculty um, go to John C. Borden Auditorium, and there was a large info session for students and faculty. And, and she let us know that there had been terrorist attacks in New York City, and there would be no classes. Classes would be canceled for that day. They said that they would like all the students and the faculty to stay in the school because it was the safest place for us to be. But there would be no classes. You could go practice, you could do whatever you want, but you had to stay in the school or in the dormitories. So on my way out of the uh, auditorium, my teacher sees me, he's like, so I'll see you at your lesson today. And I said, I, I, I thought we just had this meeting that classes were canceled. He's like, yeah, your classes, like you don't go for theory and those things, but you, you're you going to come for your piano lesson today. I'll see you at 1 o'clock. And I was like, okay. So I went to Makovsky's studio at 1 o'clock, and, and I said, you know, why are we having our lesson today? And he turned around and said to me, he's like, why did you come to New York? What, what was the purpose? What is your goal? Why did you choose the Manhattan School of Music? Why was it New York City? Why wasn't it Boston? Why wasn't it Vancouver? Because um, I had gotten to, into the uh, UBC as well. I said, well, I want to come to New York because I want to study with you. And I know that you can help me to teach me and guide me to build the career that I'd like to have. And, said, and then he said, so why don't you want your lesson then today? 
And I just paused and I said, you know, you're right. He said, if that was your goal, you should be having a lesson right now. Why would you be walking away from an opportunity to get better? We talked about five or six minutes. And then for the rest of the lesson, I played. I played. I remember exactly what I played for him. I played list sixth Paganini etude, the variations for him. I played the Chopin third Ballade for him. And he asked me, what are some of the other pieces you'd like to study? And I said, I'd really like to do Chopin Barcaro. I'd like to do the Bach Italian Concerto. He said, okay, so we'll see you next week. Let's get those pieces on the go. And in my mind, I wasn't really thinking about next week because I didn't know if there would be a September 18th. I, I didn't know if I was going to go past September 11th. Many, many, many years later, after graduating, I'm still living in the city, I'd go and see Makovsky for lessons. And I, and I said, you remember, um, you know, our very first lesson? He said, oh, yes, I remember that very well. And I said, you know, that was a very important lesson to me. And he said, why? And I said, because you taught me that no matter what's going on in this world, to become a musician, you have to fight for it every single day. And I didn't know if I was going to live another day after that. <clears throat> And then that's where he cut me off and he said, exactly, Derek. He said, your goal is to come to New York and to learn. And if there's one thing you're going to do that day, he said, you are going to learn whether you're going to make it out that day or not. I mean, it sounds very grim, okay? But he was very honest with it. And the other thing he said was even more touching afterwards. He goes, there's another reason why I wanted you to take your lesson that day. And I said, okay, what is that? And he said, well, it was a safe place for you to be. He's like, I know what you're all doing. You guys are all huddled around the TVs. You're staring, you're watching the news, and your mind isn't, you're, you're completely on what's happening. He's like, you came to your lesson, and for that hour in time, your mind wasn't on what was going on with the terrorists. Your mind was completely on music and listening and learning, and that was the most important thing. And he said, there was a way to keep you safe. There was a way to get you distracted. And I thank him for that every single time I see him. Because that's how I prepared, believe it or not, for this pandemic. I was ready for this pandemic when it broke because the same thing happened and I emailed my students and I shared this story with them. And I said, I'll see you at your lessons. We're gonna continue everything remotely. We're gonna get started this week. You know, the first lesson might be a little bit longer than usual because we gotta get all the tech set up. But we're going to use this pandemic, we're going to use COVID as an opportunity to get better every single day. We're not going to sit and sit back and say, oh, we're not playing in the festival because it's been canceled. Or we're not going to wait and decide and see what Royal Conservatory decides to do with their exams. No, we're just going to go and plow ahead. It's important for all of us to have role models because role models allow us to fight for what's important. <clears throat> To this day, Michael Jordan's my greatest role model. This is a man who played in the game and had the flu. He could barely walk. Some people say it was actually food poisoning because he had some um, pizza the night before at around 12 o'clock and got really sick. But he was very, very sick. He couldn't, um, he couldn't walk on the court. He needed his teammate, Scottie Pippen, to help him on and off the court. And there's this very iconic video of... Scottie Pippen helping Michael Jordan off the court and back to the bench. <clears throat> Here's a man who had this nasty fever, nasty flu, food poisoning. And he led his team to win. Nothing stopped him. Ying Po Wan is my grandfather. He's one of China's most respected painters. <clears throat> and I had a chance to live with him for his last three or four years. <clears throat> And I saw how an artist worked. <clears throat> he was relentless. Every single morning he would get up, he'd have his breakfast, he'd grab his art easel, he'd grab his canvases and his brushes, and he would practice. And he, and he would explain to me he was practicing mixing colors to find the right combination of colors by blending. And then he would practice his brush strokes, and then he would do some painting. I'd come home from school and he'd be, he'd be painting. Um, on the weekends, we would go to the mountains and, and he would paint in the Rocky Mountains. I'd carry some of his gear. My brother would carry some of it. And it was, it was very interesting to hear what he did and how he perceived life and perceived art. And so 
every every time I had a chance to watch him paint, it was a chance for me to learn. It was a chance for me just to absorb and to take information in. These are three of my piano teachers, Dr. E. Gregory Butler, Joel Hastings, and Solomon Mikowski. They are my role models. They have taught me to overcome adversity so that I'm ready for instances like the pandemic. This is really, really important. As teachers, this is your role to be your student's role model. The truth is, for many, many students, they don't know professional musicians. They don't know who Kissin is. Maybe they've never heard about Long Long or Yuja Wong. But they know you. You're their professional musician in their life. And if you want your students to practice, then you have to set the example for them. You have to do the practicing. If you want your students to perform well on stage, then demonstrate how to do it. Go on stage. Now, I'm not asking you as a teacher to go and play Bach Italian Concerto. I'm not saying go and do a piece that you did in your ARCT or your level 10 or master's or undergraduate degree recitals. Play anything. You know, I, I played a virtual concert on Wednesday, and one of the pieces I played was Oscar Peterson's Jazz exercise number two from the level eight syllabus but you know i played it and i played it well and i played it musically and then the audience they didn't know it was a level well maybe some knew it was a level eight piece but i had an audience from china taiwan italy united states it was just music to them so for teachers you don't have to go and learn the most complex piece. You don't have to go back and do something you did in your undergrad. I mean, if you want to, great, fantastic. But at your next student recital on the virtual stage, play something, prepare something to play. Use the music, go by memory, doesn't matter, but just play well. Demonstrate to your students because this is what's going to inspire them and this is what's going to be a lasting image for them. They're always going to remember their teacher playing. And I heard all three of my teachers play. Solomon Mikowski, however, um, he couldn't play anything with his right hand. His, he has a tendon, it's, it's damaged in his thumb. So it, it's very minimal movement in there. But I heard him demonstrate a lot of the things I was working on. He would use his left hand and play the right hand line. There were times where he played the left hand line, that's right, the right hand line with his left hand better than I could play it with my right hand. And Dr. E. Gregory Butler, he, for the four years we worked together, I heard him play every single year, numbers of times, whether it was concerto, chamber music, or solo performances. I heard him play a lot, and it really inspired me. Joel Hastings, he was a finalist in the Clyburn back in like 2000, and one of the pieces that he played so much, and, and, and why I love it to this day, is the um, list Totentons, and, it, and every time I play it's in honor of him. Joel passed away about four years ago, uh, suddenly to a heart attack. And my other role models include Tim Duncan and Greg Popovich because every great basketball player needs a great coach, and every great musician needs a great teacher, and vice versa. Every great student creates a great teacher. It's a really important relationship that we have as teachers with our students or me as a student with my teacher. We inspire each other. We, we motivate each other. We learn from one another. We, we get innovative. And that's the great relationship Tim Duncan and Greg Popovich had. A great talent with a great basketball mind. And every single year during the reign, they improved. They learned new ideas together. They got mad at each other. They grew together. And my favorite pianist of all time, Shura Tchaikovsky. One of the reasons why I adore this man is that the sound he makes is one of the most magical sounds. So for every student out there, I think it's really important that you listen to some music and you have a role model, have a musician. It doesn't have to be a pianist. If you're a pianist and you love a certain violinist, then, then great. Or if you're a singer and you really love a clarinetist, great but you want to have someone to look up to someone to show you what music is all about and to dream about and to listen to their sound and have this vision of what potentially you could be doing the other reason why i really like Sher Tchaikovsky 
is because he learned new music every year. And when I mean new music, I mean contemporary music. Music that was composed that year, he would perform it, he would learn it and perform it. So he was a, uh, an advocate for new compositions. A great performer who plays everything by Chopin would always present a newly composed work on his uh, recitals. He was never afraid to introduce something new to his audience. And I think this is wonderful. So we need role models. You, the teachers out there, will you be one for your students? And, and who is yours? You know, find your role model. Find someone who really, really inspires you, whether it's in the music world or the sports world. Maybe it's the business world. There's a lot of great stories out there of people who have overcome adversity and, and have really found success in what they do. Steel sharpens steel. I mean, we hear this all the time. So this pandemic has sharpened me and, and it's changed the way I practice. And this is really important. This is what this whole talk is about. It's not simple. It's not simply just, okay, I'm gonna sit at the piano. I'm gonna do what my teacher asks me. And it's not as simple as the teacher saying, okay, go ahead and do it this way. I'll see you next week. No, I think what we have to do with practicing is we have to evolve every single day. We have to become a better person when it comes to practicing. Remember, music and arts led cultural and revolutionary changes, okay? People would pay attention to what was happening in arts all the time, right? Architecture of the Baroque period. The whole Romantic period was spurred by German Romantic poets. So we should be using things in everyday life in these pandem this pandemic to become better at what we do. We need to evolve our practicing. And we have all this great, great technology that we could utilize. You can see that I have this pair of headphones on, okay? I think this is really important. If we're going to be listening to music, okay, and this is for teachers and students, we need these, we need headphones. Unless you happen to have very, very good studio monitors in your home, this is the, these are what you need to hear your students or students to hear their teachers. The, the speakers in our devices, whether it's our phones, our iPads, our computers, are only so good. They don't help us hear all the little sonorities of color or the nuances in the music. But if you get a good pair of headphones, it does make a big difference. Now you don't need to spend a ton of money either, okay? Um, by the way, there's Black Friday coming up, so a lot of stores in Canada and the United States are gonna have sales. Amazon's gonna have sales. I saw on a website last night that there's these Bayer Dynamic headphones that are on sale for like $90. And I was like, wow, those are really, really inexpensive. So I sent an email to all my students. I was like, if you don't have your headphones, this is a really good time to pick up this pair. So getting a good set of headphones will really allow you to hear things. For those of you who don't have one of these, grab one of these, a microphone. These are really inexpensive as well because the microphones in our devices don't allow you to pick up and to hear the sound, okay? So I'm gonna give you, you know, some suggestions. Like this one is one that I use. It's it's a Samsung G-Track Pro. It's, it's very good for music. Um, I'll play something here, just a scale, and you'll, you'll be able to hear that there's dynamics. This one picks up a lot of dynamics. And again, these are not expensive devices. They're very inexpensive. And again, um, they can be used outside of the music lesson as well. So for those students thinking, well, getting a microphone just for my 30 or 45 or one hour long lesson might not be worth it. Yeah, but you know, for the parents, you're on your Zoom calls all day, you're on your Microsoft Teams. Um, you know, if you're sick and tired of yelling and talking to your colleagues, the microphone is, is great because you can talk at your regular speaking voice and everyone can really hear you clearly. Um, my headphones, 
These are ones that rest over the ear, so it's very, very comfortable. I don't like the earbud ones. They hurt after a while. And those earbud ones aren't that great um, for the health of your ears either. So getting some over the ear headphones are, are really good. I use a couple other devices as well. Um, I have this, and now you can see it through the video, it changes the lighting, so I have a, a light so it helps um, light up my studio. Um, I also use a Tascam DR40X as a microphone from time to time. But And these are the things that help me to evolve my teaching because without it, I wasn't able to produce the sound. My students weren't able to hear what I wanted them to do uh, in, their, in their lessons. E-learning, this is the power of the 20th, 21st century. Okay, let's take a look at a couple slides here. It says here, 94% of students say digital learning technologies help them to retain new concepts. Now, this is not me. This is from McGraw-Hill educators in a survey they did in the uh, United States in 2017, this digital study trends. You can actually find that study trend online. You can see the website down there. Take a look at it. Utilizing whether it's a tablet or your laptop to learn is really beneficial. So one of the things I do with my students is I record their Zoom lessons. Now, there's a couple reasons for this. One of the reasons why I will record the Zoom lesson is that they can then watch the lesson over again and they can watch the things I've done, the videos. They can re-listen to how I'm teaching them or the suggestions I'm giving. But most importantly, they can watch themselves play now. Back in the day, I remember my teacher saying, you know, if you have a, you know, if you, your parents have a camcorder, it'd be really good if you could record your, your practicing and then watch it. Well, my parents didn't have a video recorder, so that was completely out of the question. We couldn't do that. But now it is very possible. Every single person on here today can record. You're watching from your phone or your tablet or your laptop. So you can record your playing. You can record your lessons. And it's amazing what you can learn from watching yourself play. But the thing is, as teachers, we have to teach our students to watch. We have to show them what to watch for. Okay. And in my preparation for concerts, I recorded myself many times for my virtual performances. And that was very helpful for me to record just my hands so I could see how my fingers were working, how my hand position was. Sometimes I set the camera further back to observe pedaling as well, posture, seating position. And I did that with my students. And I said, take a look at your wrist. Look at your hand position here. Is that the proper hand position? Is it too high or is it too low? And when they saw it, they were able to make an adjustment. They were able to make a correction because they could see from the side. Perhaps they didn't see when they're looking over top of their hands, but when they saw from the side view, they were able to, to get it and say, okay, I see what I'm doing wrong here. Or I see what I need to, to kind of tweak. Over 60% of students say digital learning technology has improved their grades. Again, same, from the same study. Why? Because these technologies are allowing us to streamline and identify the things that we're doing really, really well and the things that we need work on. I don't say mistakes, things we need to work on. Because when we're learning something, okay, students, teachers, when we're learning something, we're not supposed to get it right the very first time or the second time or the third time, okay? Those aren't mistakes, that's called learning, okay? And we often, as educators, say, oh, you made a mistake here. Well, I look at it and I say, no, you didn't make a mistake. To me, it's like, okay, what do I need to do to help a student learn to overcome that? I don't blame it on them. When my students have issues in learning, it means I haven't done a good enough job explaining it to them. I haven't demonstrated it. I haven't been responsible about it. Because if they're having issues and they're having those quote-unquote mistakes, it's a reflection of what I'm doing. 
And I need to be better about that. I'm not going to put the responsibility on them, especially during a pandemic. You know, some of my students I have not seen face to face since March. Now, I do teach a couple of my students in person, but my studio has been mostly virtual since March. And I'm trying to do my part to keep the numbers low and keep everyone safe. Right. That's just I think it's a responsible thing to do. And I know. Teaching online is challenging. It's not for everybody. And and for many music teachers, this was something that was thrown onto your lap and you had no time to prepare and you literally had to transform your lives over in 12 hours. But it's gonna be like this for, forever. Not the pandemic, but virtual learning is going to be here to stay, okay? And this is gonna be the power of how you can build your business. You could be in Vancouver or Calgary or Toronto or anywhere in the world and have a student anywhere else in the world. This morning, I got up, did my practicing at five o'clock in the morning. Then I tuned into a two hour master class with a Hungarian violist from Hungary at um, 9.30 my time. So it must have been, I think it's a nine hour difference between Calgary and Hungary, nine or 10 hour difference. So it's uh, in the evening for this professor. And so for two hours, I listened to this Hungarian professor uh, do a master class on the Brahms Opus 120 Viola Sonata. And he had four different performers from around the world. They weren't in Hungary. There was one girl from Serbia. I believe there's one person from Israel. And I can't remember where the other two were from. I think one's from the U.S. So here we are all connected from around the world musically. So virtual is going to be here. Yes, once vaccines and everything's good to go, we'll see our students in our homes. But hey, you know what? What if they're sick? What if they come home from sick from school and they don't want to come for the lesson? Well, you have the gear. Go virtual. Or perhaps there's a snowstorm. They don't want to make the drive go virtual that way you don't owe any lessons that way there's no makeup lessons ever needed you can always be consistent I've been teaching virtually for 10 years now as a rural conservatory examiner I'm on the road quite a bit and I'm always on the road when my students have to take exams right because I have to examine so I've been teaching virtually during those times to listen to my students before they go into their exams So record your performance and analyze it. This is the one thing. This is one thing I do a lot now. I do because I really like to watch the video. It's no different than um, Kobe Bryant or Michael Jordan watching video of them playing the game in key moments because that's how they got better, and that's how we're going to get better. When we're playing and we're practicing, there are so many things happening at once. They all can go by and we could pick up some and, and, and forget about others. So it's really important that if we record it, we come back and analyze it, we can catch every little thing. We can catch the things that went really well and the things that we need to work on. And then we record ourselves again and we analyze another step. And we said, did we do it? Did, we, did I fix the mistake? What more can I do? Practice performances online. I did a lot of this. I've always been practicing my performance. It's something that my teacher, Dr. Butler, had asked us to always do. I would never go on stage with a piece unless I had played it many times for other people. And I know for a lot of students, when you walk into your exam or you walk into the festival, it is the very, very first time you've performed your program for somebody live. And I think this is a big mistake. And that's one of the reasons why you may be nervous because you actually haven't done, you haven't gotten comfortable playing in front of somebody. And with the technology we have now, it's so easy. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. I Before I played this virtual concert on Wednesday, I went online. I called, emailed, texted my musician friends. And I said, do you have, you know, 30, 40 minutes just to listen to me play through my program. Everyone said yes. It was great. It was so comforting to play on Wednesday because I had played my program successfully for about seven people within the last two weeks. What was really good about this too is 
I learned a new skill. Because I also had my friends on the other end, I said, I'm going to try different microphones and I want you to listen and let me know what you hear. And I took notes. And then I went back to that first step I have written on the page. It record your performance and I analyze it. And I listened to my sound based on the different microphones I had. And, and that helped me to fine tune what I could do online. Because I know the sound's never going to be perfect. It's better with microphones, but it's not perfect. And, and so it, it gave me a clear idea of, of how to work the dynamics out. With online performances, you almost have to be very extreme with softs and louds so that they really come out. But I need to also know what the mic levels were. I want to make sure that the loud wasn't peaking. It wasn't creating distortion. Um, for a lot of my students who did their advanced exams this past year, they had to record their level 9, 10, or AR and then submit it by a link to the Royal Conservatory. And this is a skill I had never done before. I had never taken an audio, recorded a separate audio track and synced it with a video. And so I, I did it myself. I tried it first. I recorded this little piece by Schumann from Carnival Aveu. It was part of a larger project of a group of international pianists performing Schumann's Great Carnival. So we, there were about 30 of us. We each played a different movement. So I learned. I learned how to edit the video and the sound and to sync it so that it was all aligned. And so I learned how to do that. I, I taught my students how to do that. I taught them how to take the audio file and the video file to sync together. Now, I didn't edit the audio file I let we because we're not allowed to for the Royal Conservatory exam. We just left the audio file by itself and it was just simply putting the, the video and the audio together. And it's not that hard, believe it or not. You know, Apple has got some really wonderful, you know, software to use. So using iMovies, I just used iMovies. And that was all it was. And I just put it together. I showed my students and they said, oh, this is really cool. So I learned a new skill and I shared a new skill. I put, I said, you know, mistakes, it's bad to call them mistakes, but I don't have another word for it. So I embrace the mistake. I look at the mistake as the most important thing that can happen because, again, it teaches me how to get better. And it teaches me how to get better as a practicer and as a teacher. When something doesn't go right in my practice, I go back to the top. I recorded it, and I'm going to analyze it now. And I'm going to find a solution to it. This is really important is that no matter what we do, we always find a solution. It just can't be like, well, I'll fix it tomorrow. No, that's not the way it is. It's let's fix it now, but let's find out how to fix it. And be honest with yourself. I think this is so very, very important. It's very easy just to say, you know, that's never happened before. I'll come back and I'll fix it later. Or it won't be here tomorrow. I don't think like that. If something doesn't go wrong, there's a reason why it went wrong. I, I want to be proactive about it. I don't want to be reactive. I want to figure it out. And that's why technology is so great. Okay. Let's say as a student, you have something you're practicing that's not going well for you. Why don't you record yourself? Then send that recording to your teacher and say, look, I have been trying to do this this week. I can't figure it out. I cannot do it. Great. As a teacher, I would say, okay, let's try these things. I would make a video and I'd send it back to my student. I was like, try it this way. Try this technique and let's see what happens next time you see me. This idea of the video exchange is e extremely valuable because again, um, you know, sound can be tiring off Zoom and the digital sound. It can hurt the ears after a while. But if you make a recording, it's not just a recording that they're going to use today. It's a recording they can use down the road. It's in their collection. It's in their resources for study. So making little videos can be very helpful for both the student and the teacher. And this is a very powerful, like I said, it's a very, very powerful tool for preparation. All these things I've learned during the pandemic to enhance my practicing, 
I'm going to keep doing them once the pandemic is over. I'm going to continue to record myself and listen. Um, prior to always you know, playing online for people, what I would always do is I'd call them up and I'd go to their studio or they come to my studio. And, you know, that's, that's extra bit of time, right? Not to drive or they have to drive and everyone's busy. Now with Zoom or Skype or Google Meet or whatever you're using, it's so easy to do that. You know, so yeah, I got time on Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Yeah, I can give you 30 minutes. Bam, there you go, right? And then you sign off, you're still at home. You didn't have to go and drive home. So it's very, very convenient for that. And and look, you could do that and have numbers of people. You can have two or three people or four or five people watching you, providing you input and then helping you prepare for your concerts. This is what I would do, you know, play for your grandparents, kids. Play for your friends. All of my students who took exams this year, you know, it's a new experience to go online and do a remote exam. It was a new experience for me as an examiner, it was a new experience as a teacher, and playing performances, new, that was a new experience. So I asked my students, I said, before you go and do your exam on whatever day it is, I want you to have performed your program through for 10 different people. I go, do you have 10 friends you could do it? There's some friends from school who haven't seen you in months because you can't go out and hang out. You can't have play dates. How about your grandparents? How about your aunt and uncle? Maybe one of your um, parents' friends. The more you do this, the more comfortable you will get for your performance, whether it's an exam or a festival or a competition or an audition. Okay? It's not just practicing your scales and practicing your pieces. There's, it's really important to practice your performance. Adversity is a mentality. It's, it's not a way of life. People look at adversity and they put it upon themselves and then they fall to it and they give it an excuse. And, and I don't like that. There's things I, I don't accept in my studio, things like I can't, I won't. So my students say, know that they cannot say, I can't do this. They can't say, this is hard or this is difficult. What they have been trained and learned is that, okay, this passage of music is challenging, but I can overcome it. With practice, I can beat this. And that's what success is. Success is a mentality. Like I said at the very beginning, I walk on stage knowing I'm going to play well. And again, it's not arrogant, it's not cocky. It's just the way I believe and I know I can do it because I've done all the practice. That's what the difference is, okay? Some people walk on stage hoping. I walk on stage knowing because I've done that practice. That's what the main difference is. This is, uh, I really like this. This is from um, a female poet from Beirut, Malak El Halabi. She's, she's it's got some really great um, quotes. Read this one out loud. You know, sometimes we don't read things out loud. I think reading out loud is really important. Now that your eyes are open, make the sun jealous with your burning passion to start the day. Make the sun jealous or stay in bed. And that's sort of my message is that with music, go and do it. Don't let anything stop you. Don't let this pandemic be an issue, okay? You can grow, you can change the way you practice, you can evolve, you can use the technology. Because it's here. And technology takes allows us to take advantage of doing things with many easier steps. I like the end, make the sun jealous or stay in bed. Yeah. And and, and I could say in a much harsher way, I, I think the way that this poet wrote it is very graceful and very elegant. For me, it's it's just, you either do it or you don't. And for many of my colleagues, this pandemic has been that for them. I, I have some colleagues that have decided, you know what, I, I'm not doing the music thing anymore because I don't know when my next gig is gonna be. I don't know when my next concert's gonna be. So I've seen some of my colleagues and some of my friends go into different fields now. Some are going back to studying. They're going and doing their um, MBAs. 
some are getting their real estate licenses. But I also have a lot of friends who are using this time the same way I am, just learning. Because the last time I had time to learn music and to really learn it and to take my time to learn it was in college. That was the last time, and that's some 16 years ago. Since then, since I graduated, it's been a go. It's been a race every day of getting my professional career off the ground and growing and, and letting it flourish. I've expanded some of the things I do. It's not just about teaching and performing. Doing these online uh, showcases, the speaking engagements like today. I started a music consultation business as well where I help teachers transform their online so their in-person studio to be online i did a, a session for tom lee back in april which had over 2,000 music teachers from across canada and the united states attend that was hosted by tom lee and it had myself and uh patrick calabre from ubc chris foley from ontario and a Jan um aaron parks from ottawa all of us were talking about and helping teachers get online and so I've added the consultation business to my portfolio of things I do because I said you know I know how to do this and there's a lot of teachers struggling let me help them and by doing so I've learned a lot because I'm hearing how some of these teachers teach and the only way I can help them get better at online teaching is to see what they're doing and helping them be creative to take those ideas virtual. Well, by doing so, I've learned some really great pedagogical ideas for teaching that I've applied to my own students now. So I'm learning from them, they're learning from me, teachers. It's great. So take steps. This is very temporary, the pandemic, but your mentality for growth and the mentality for practicing and to be better every single day is never going to change. It's always going to be there if you're a musician. So thank you very much for your time today. If there's any questions, I'll take them now, but I'm going to just leave you my contact information here. My phone number, WhatsApp, email, uh, my website, also two additional websites for the summer festivals I teach at, and also uh, my YouTube and Instagram page. So. Um, if there's any questions, Natalia, you can <clears throat> send yeah, them Yeah, I, I actually have some questions. So um, there's actually six um, people yeah. privately message me. So the first one is from Sasha, and uh, she's asking how to practice when feeling unmotivated or stuck on a certain piece and how to move past it. Sure. Um, that happens to everybody, okay? Sometimes not practicing is the best thing to do, believe it or not. If, and... and I'll explain, I'll explain why, because if you're not motivated to practice, perhaps you're not paying attention to what you're doing. You're not concentrating. So you're actually going to do a little bit of harm to yourself. You could learn something incorrectly. You could be having mistakes in your playing. And then you have to come back and fix it later, right? And, and so when I'm not really in the mood to practice, I don't practice. I mean, that's really the simple thing to do. And I come back later when I'm ready to practice. So, and, and that's sometimes the case. I'm a little tired. Okay, there's no point in practicing and, and doing damage. Come back when I'm a little bit more refreshed. Um, the pandemic pandemic has been great too because what I, I, I did a lot was go for walks, ride my bike, and that really helped to clear my mind as well. So um, getting some fresh air where I, I usually go to the gym and get my exercise and the gyms were closed. It was like, well... You know, I got my bike and I live in this great part of the city where there's a lot of nature and a lot of like trees and, and, and lakes and ponds. Why don't I go and explore my, my neighborhood? Practicing is also is not everything you do at the piano or your instrument, whether it's the flute or voice or whatever it is. Practicing also means listening. So if you don't feel like physically practicing, why don't you listen to your piece? Go on YouTube, go on Naxos. Find your, a recording of your piece and listen to it with your music, with the score, and just study it and just see what other musicians are doing with it. Don't copy what they're doing, but just listen to the musical ideas. And then music has to be fun. Maybe you don't want to practice, but you want to sit at the, your instruments. Do something fun. Play 
some fun music um, that you haven't done in a while. Maybe play a jazz lick or something like that. Maybe play a Disney theme tune. Do something that encourages you, again, that music is, is really fun. But my, my main suggestion is if you're really uninspired or unmotivated at that moment, just walk away. That's the safest and best thing to do. Cool. So then Min asks, how to get over stage fright? Okay, so we kind of went over that. Um, one of the best things simply to do is just call people up and say, hey, do you got 10, 15 minutes to listen to me perform this piece? Uh, we'll, we'll just meet on Zoom, we'll meet on Skype or WhatsApp or FaceTime. Just listen to me play, you know, and, and that's very helpful to get over it. Now, one of the things I like to do is that, again, it's a mentality. If I'm starting a piece on day one, I know I'm going to perform it 200 days later. I am not worried that I'm going to play it poorly. I'm going to play it well. I've got 200 days to practice it. That's a lot of time, right? So don't forget, every single thing you're doing in your practice, if it's good practice, it's going to lead to a very good performance. You have to believe that, right? And here's the other thing. And I said this earlier, I like to react to the audience. The audience is your fan. Your audience is there to listen to you. They're not there to judge you. They're taking time out of their day to hear you because they want to hear you. So think about it this way. When was the last time you went to a movies, okay, I know it's a long time for all of us, but when was the last time you went and purposely went to see the worst movie that was there? No one does that. No one says, you know, I'm gonna go and watch this really terrible movie. I'm gonna spend 20 bucks to go see the worst movie. No one does that. When we go to the movies, we go because we can't wait to see what's going on. And guess what? Your audience is the exact same way. Your audience is going to hear you and they're looking forward to hearing you. So don't think about your audience as a negative thing. Think about your audience as a group of people who are there to support you and encourage you and they can't wait to hear you. And, and it's again, it's a mentality. It's the way you think about performance. Okay. And then obviously, you know, listen to your teacher, right? Work with your teacher, follow the directions of your teacher uh, and be smart about your practice. Because if you, if you have issues in your practicing, guess what? Those issues show up in performance. If you don't have issues in your practicing, there's no issues in your performance. Cool. Then Eric asks, how much time should I focus on technique versus my pieces? I mean, this is a loaded question. I could talk about this for hours. It's like a um, whole other uh, workshop. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I, I, I don't, I, what I like to recommend to my students is that it's not about how much time you practice, okay? So Eric, it's your goals. What is, what is the goal for your technique that day for your practicing? Are you trying to uh, reach a certain tempo for a certain scale? Uh, is it learning a scale? Is it putting it hands together? Is it um, learning a new fingering? That's what dictates your practice is the goal, not the time. Same thing with your pieces. What are you trying to accomplish in your piece? For me, it, it varies. You know, some days it's like, okay, for this piece, I'm really working on getting, you know, number this number of pages memorized. Uh, with this piece, I'm really working out this very tricky technical lick that I have to really manage and get in control of. So I never set a, a time, right? I mean, I'll say I practice three hours a day, but I'm not like staring at the clock and thinking I need to do, oh, four more minutes because I'm at two hours and 56. No, it's I have goals and I go for the goals. And sometimes the practicing is done much quicker because I reach the goal quick sooner. And when I do that, then I can just practice something else. So I, I would not say, you know, dedicate half of your practice to technique and half of it to repertoire. Set a goal. What is it that you want to accomplish that day, that week? And that will then dictate how much you practice because you'll know whether you've met the goal or not. And then if you haven't, you're just going to keep fighting and fighting until you get it. Mm -hmm. um, and actually this one, I think you can answer. There's two questions. I think you can answer them together. So Sylvia asks, how do you convince your students' parents to invest in headphones and mic? And then Tom asks, which uh, headset do you recommend? Um, so 
one thing that is is if you want your students to have these things you have to have these things right and one of the best things to do is to have the equipment and then have the parents online with you and show the difference what with what the sound is like with and without the microphone right so it's very easy on zoom you just go to audio settings you can click off the microphone you can go to your the internal devices microphone and and you can say well this is what it sounds like with just a device when you play something and then you say well this is what it's going to sound like when i play it with the microphone and you know it's if you just ask someone to get something it's very hard for them to get it right it's it's about showing the difference and why that difference is important the other thing I would do is provide a document. I have a document that I put together back in April, March, April for all of my students, right? So we did the first couple lessons without microphones because everyone's just trying to figure their life around with the pandemic. It wasn't just their lessons, but people's home life, their school life, their work life. It was a very hectic time as you can all remember. So, and it gave me time within those couple of weeks, I went and did a lot of research and I picked up, I went to, my, my local uh, audio visual store here in Calgary and bought like six different microphones, by the way. And I tried them all. And that was the thing, because I, I didn't know much about it myself. And, and so I had to educate myself about it. If I was gonna ask my students to purchase these things, I needed to be on top of it. So I talked to the audio guys and I said, okay, I'm using it for music lessons. What do I need, right? Back in the day when I was doing virtual lessons, it was just, again, be a couple here and there. So there was literally never a need for the microphone, but now I, I realize I do need it. So I tried them and, and, and I showed my students in the lessons, like here's the different microphones I'm using. You can hear the sound. And then I put a document together and I, because I don't know the financial situation of all my students. I listed about 10 different microphones from the $50 to the $300 range price tags. And, and I said, you know, this is the information, this is the research I, I can provide for you. If you choose not to get a, a microphone, there's only so much I can do because I cannot hear everything that your son or daughter is working on. And I said, I'm only gonna ask, I'm only gonna ask you once, right? It's your decision. I'm not gonna beg you to, to do this. So to my surprise, um, everyone ended up getting one of two or three different microphones, believe it or not. Yeah, it was kind of crazy. It was awesome because they all, within a couple of weeks, had microphones, you know, they had to wait for Amazon or they just went and picked it up at the store. Um, so most of my students did pick up the Tascam DR05 uh, or the 40X. Some picked up the, the Zoom H1N, which is not like um, related to Zoom Cloudbeam, but there's a, a company, a tech, company called zoom they make um, video conferencing software um, and a couple teachers have been asking me and they've picked up these um, the Samsung's that I'm using as well because they heard me do some online master classes that's another thing I've been doing a lot of online master classes for uh, different music schools and for this um, education platform I call I work for called virtuosity online and so teachers, oh, what microphone are you using? I can hear a lot of like nuances and stuff. And I said, well, it's just this one. So having that information ready to hand out to your students is really helpful. And it helps them to, to do some shopping because otherwise they have to do all that work themselves and they're already busy and they, they don't know. They, and, and so if you can provide some information to them, it helps them. Now headphones, look, there's, hundreds of options out there <laughs> for headphones. Um, I, I use, these ones are Audio-Technica uh, M70Xs. They're, they're studio headphones, they're amazing. I can, I can hear so well with them. Um, but the Audio-Technica line of headphones, they have like the M40s, the M50s, they're all excellent. M40s are a little bit less expensive, I think in the $150 range. The Bayer Dynamics are very good, Sennheisers, um, one of the keys is that you got to get one that's wired. Okay. Don't get Bluetooth because Bluetooth creates lag. So from time to time, what you'll do is you'll hear the sound and you'll be watching your students fingers and it doesn't line up. <laughs> right. And that's a big problem. So Bluetooth will always create lag. So get a wired pair of, um, headphones. Um, 
I like the Audio Technica ones because it comes with three different lengths of cable. So that way I can, you know, walk around. I don't have, um, I want a long cable. So if I'm turning to the piano, I'm not fidgeting around with the cable and knocking things over. Um, because that's, you know, the piano's here and I don't want a microphone falling on a piano, you know, on, on, on my Steinway. That'd be really bad. Um, I would avoid anything by uh, Dr. Dre. Don't get the beats. Don't get JBLs. Because those ones are designed, you know, for pop music and they're heavy on the bass end. You want a pair of headphones that's really good in all ranges. And so the, the studio style headphones that you can get, um, you know, Tom Lee, Long McQuaid, those ones, um, you know, they have some really good people at those stores too. I know downtown Tom Lee, those guys are great. They, they know a lot about this stuff and you can talk to them. And um, that's downtown Vancouver uh, for you who are in Vancouver. In, in Calgary, the guys at uh, Steinway Piano Gallery are really good. Uh, but here's the best thing. If you go online, there are so many different people who have done video blogs and, and regular written blogs about headphones that they like. And, you know, just spend the weekend doing a little research. It's Black Friday. Places are having sales on Monday. Um, in a lot of these places, they give you you know, like 10, 14 days to try things out. And that's what I would do. Just grab a pair of headphones um, after you've done some research and then listen to some music, right? So listen to some music online, whether it's on YouTube or Naxos or uh, Medici or whatever it is. And, and, and judge for yourself. Everyone has a different taste when it comes to headphones and what's comfortable. I get over the ear because I wear these all day, right? So they, they don't sit on the ear. They're they go around my earlobe and so it's very comfortable and um what's also good is that you can then control the volume as well so on my microphone on the samsung i can control the volume of what the microphone picks up on the piano and also what's coming in from my students and so i can always get a good balance cool and then the last question and actually i'm really glad someone asked this because if they did i would ask it <laughs> is how do you deal and prevent technology exhaustion? <laughs> um, you know, one of the, you just got to walk away, like I said, once in a while, right? I mean, it's technology is with us no matter what, right? I mean, some of us have a fridge that tells us when the milk is about to expire, right? Um, everything's plugged into my smartphone, my, my humidifiers, my, you know, heating, you know, my doorbell my car, it's all, you know, so you got to turn this stuff off once in a while and, and get and go outside, you know, walk around, read a book. These are these are things that I like to do and I think are very helpful because just staring at your screen, sure, it can be exhausting. Now, sometimes you can't get away from it. And there are some technology that will help you with technology exhaustion, by the way, believe it or not. So if you're if you're teaching and you're using a smaller screen, get a bigger screen. OK, you can Apple TV or Chromecast it to your TV. And I do that once in a while. Sometimes, you know, instead of staring at this screen that I'm using, I just put it on my TV. Um, instead of using headphones, sometimes I just turn on my home theater and I just, you know, plug in the home theater, the HDMI into my laptop so that I can hear it on the speakers in the ceiling. So I can use technology to get over technology because again, yeah, this can get tiring after a while. Looking at a small screen can get tiring. So put it on a bigger screen. But but the, the really the best thing is walk away. You know, when I teach my students online, I, you know, in person it was different. I'd see them back to back, but online I put like a 15 minute break in between because sometimes I have to go and retrieve some books. I have to like fill up my coffee, right? I have to fill, well, I have to fill up my coffee a lot it seems like so little things like that just walking away I have a walkout basement so I can just go walk outside in that 15 minutes sit you know maybe not now because it's freezing cold but um, in the summer I would just set up I had my chair I just sit out there and then come back in and teach um, and for those of you who don't teach piano right like violin or trumpet or flute any instrumentals look if the weather is nice where you are, teach outside. If you still want to see your students in person, take it outside. You can. I mean, I can't I can't push my piano outside no matter how much I'd like to, but 
you know, you could, if you're, you can teach on your porch or your deck, you can teach in your garage if you, if you don't want to do virtual, but you want to see your students. So be creative that way. Don't, don't think that you're limited to it. If you, if you happen to have very good weather where you are and, and you have the opportunity to take your instrument outside, then do so. And, and, or, okay, maybe you're doing piano, right? Take the theory outside, right? In the spring, summer, take it outside. You can sit there. Uh, on the grass like you can create activities to do in your backyard um, when it comes to to studying music we don't always have to be in front of our instrument to be doing it mm -hmm. yeah so that that concludes all the questions i just want to say a huge thank you um this was really informative and um just really wonderful um a couple things that really jumped out at me was being proactive versus reactive i feel like a lot of times especially with everything with covid we just been reacting so yeah, that I really like that. And then um, really walking onto the stage knowing. I think I'm going to totally use that with my students <laughs> as we uh, move forward with everything. So thank you again. Um, it was wonderful. And um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Great. great. Thanks for having me. Uh, everyone have a great weekend and uh, happy holidays coming up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye now. Okay. Bye bye. Oh, we're still here. Okay. I wasn't sure if it would hang us up. Uh, oh, wait. It says stop live stream. Okay. Let's see. There we go. Are you? Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're still there. Okay. Awesome. So we're off Facebook. Yeah. Um, just to let you know the um, yeah. so sponsor is supposed to e transfer me your funds um, either tonight or tomorrow. So I will, the latest okay, will be sure. okay. I'll be transferring. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. All right. Okay. Thank Sounds you so good. much. All right. All right. Yeah, thanks. If you need anything, just let me know. So I will. Thank you. Okay. All right. Good luck with the rest of the festival today. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye.